Pantages, Chapter 5, Joe Kennedy. In 1885, Patrick Joseph P.J. Kennedy, a saloon owner and Joseph Kennedy's father, was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives, due in large part to the strong backing he received from the liquor lobby, which was worried about the temperance movement. P.J. would serve five terms as a state representative before being elected to the Massachusetts Senate. P.J. skillfully used his political power to enrich himself and advance the career of his son, Joseph P. Kennedy. On September 6, 1888, Joseph Patrick Kennedy Sr. is born to a political family in East Boston, Massachusetts, P.J. and Mary Augusta Hickey. Joe Kennedy had a younger brother, Francis, who died young, and two younger sisters, Mary and Margaret. All four of Joe's grandparents had immigrated to Massachusetts in the 1840s to escape the Irish famine. He was born into a highly sectarian society where Irish Catholics were excluded by upper-class Boston Brahmins. Boston Irish thus became active in the Democratic Party, which included P.J. and numerous relatives. P.J. Kennedy was an accomplished businessman which enabled him to provide a comfortable lifestyle for his family as a result of his successful saloon business, investment ventures, and an influential role in local politics. His mother encouraged Joe to attend the Boston Latin School, where Kennedy was a below average scholar but was popular among his classmates, winning election as class president and playing on the school baseball team. In 1912, Joe Kennedy followed in the footsteps of older cousins by attending Harvard College. He focused on becoming a social leader, working energetically to gain admittance to the prestigious Hasty Pudding Club. While at Harvard, he joined the Delta Upsilon International Fraternity and played on the baseball team, but was blackballed by the Porcelain Club. When Joe Kennedy was fresh out of college in 1912, his father got him a job as a state bank examiner. Here, Joe had access to useful information about the confidential affairs of companies and individuals who had credit lines with major Boston banks. He found out which companies were in trouble and which had extra cash, who was planning new products or acquisitions, and who was about to be liquidated. A former Harvard classmate, Ralph Lowell, said, that bank examiner's job took him all over the state and laid bare the condition of every bank he visited. He acquired information of value to himself and others. Joe's strategy was to obtain inside information about troubled companies from banks, then drive their stock down so he could buy them more cheaply. While still on the state payroll as a bank examiner, Joe made an acquisition that was aided by inside information. He bought a Boston investment company called Old Colony Realty Associates, Inc. Joe turned the company from an old line investment firm into one that made money on the misery of others. Under Joe's direction, the company specialized in taking over defaulted home mortgages. He would then paint the houses and resell them at far higher prices. By the time the company was dissolved, Joe's $1,000 investment had grown to $75,000. Fresh out of college in 1912, his father got him a job as a state bank examiner. Here, Joe had access to obtain inside information about troubled companies from banks then drive their stock down so he could buy them more cheaply. While still on the state payroll as a bank examiner, Joe made an acquisition that was aided by inside information. He bought a Boston investment company called Old Colony Realty Associates, Inc. Joe turned the company from an old line investment firm into one that made money on the misery of others, foreclosing on their homes and reselling them. In 1914, World War I started. By 1917, the Selective Service Act was carefully drawn to remedy the defects in the Civil War system by allowing exemptions for dependency, essential occupations, and religious scruples, and by prohibiting all forms of bounties, substitutions, or purchase of exemptions. In 1917 and 18, some 24 million men were registered and nearly 3 million inducted into the military with little of the overt resistance that characterized the Civil War. In the United States during World War I, the word slacker was commonly used to describe someone who was not participating in the war effort, especially someone who avoided military service, an equivalent of the 
later term, Draft Dodger. Attempts to track down such evaders were called Slacker Raids. On October 7th, Joe Kennedy married Rose Elizabeth Fitzgerald, the eldest daughter of Boston Mayor John F. Honey Fitz Fitzgerald. He was a political rival of Joseph's father, PJ, and daughter of Mary Josephine Josie Hannon. The marriage joined two of the city's most prominent political families. Joe would use this new connection for all it was worth. In 1917, with World War I already in progress, the United States government announced that young men could be drafted into military service and that draft resistors would be executed. The U.S. Armed Services actively solicited volunteers with an astonishingly inventive array of recruitment posters, but it wasn't enough. On May 18, 1917, the Selective Service Act authorized the raising of a non-volunteer army. Men between the ages of 21 and 31 years old were required to register and the first draft lottery was conducted on July 20, 1917. Those who avoided participation in the draft came to be known as slackers, derived from the Latin laxus. The word was used primarily for nautical purposes prior to the war, a description for a slow moving current, a slacker tide or slacker water. Once the war effort began, however, slacker became shorthand for a range of activities to perceive to be unpatriotic. Joe Kennedy had already been placed in class one and was subject to immediate call up when his father-in-law, Mayor Fitzgerald, acquired a job for him at the Bethlehem Shipbuilding Corporation in Quincy, Massachusetts. Although Joe knew nothing about shipbuilding, he was made general manager, a job which effectively kept him out of the war. Although most of Joe Kennedy's friends from Harvard had already volunteered to serve, Joe had no intention of fighting. Joe had already been placed in class one and was subject to immediate call up when his father-in-law, Mayor Fitzgerald, acquired a job for him at the Bethlehem Steel Shipbuilding Corporation in Quincy. Although Joe knew nothing about shipbuilding, he was made general manager, a job which effectively kept him out of the war through which he developed a friendship with Franklin D. Roosevelt, then the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Daniel Strohmeyer, Vice President of Bethlehem Steel said, Joe was accommodated to skip the draft during World War I because a lot of pressure from his father-in-law. Seven months after the armistice was signed to end World War I, Joe left the shipyard. Having avoided the draft, he had no more need to work there. Joe's second child, also a son, John F. Kennedy, was born in Brookline, Massachusetts to Joseph B. Kennedy Sr. and Rose Kennedy. By the term slacker, we mean to convey the idea that one whose liberties and property are protected by a government supported by the sacrifices which are being made by the brave American soldier and refuses to aid the government to the extent of his ability is a traitor to his country and a disgrace to his community. Slacker lists were printed in newspapers. Those who refused to purchase war bonds were publicly outed as bond slackers. The use of the term slacker by a prosecutor to describe a criminal defendant was considered so prejudicial as to constitute grounds for reversal of a conviction. Indeed, for a brief period of time, there were few words more incendiary or more defamatory. Many libel cases arose from the use of the term slacker during the war, but perhaps the most well-known was Choctaw Coal and Mining Company versus Lillich. On July 18, 1918, while the war was raging, the words, list of slackers, John Lillich, were painted near the entrance to the Choctaw Coal Mine in Walker County, Alabama. Mr. Lillich brought a defamation suit against the mining company. The jury returned a verdict for the plaintiff and the company appealed. The company asserted that the word slacker was not so awful that it was defamatory per se, actionable without proof of specific harm, and the jury should have been so charged. The Alabama Supreme Court resoundingly disagreed, holding, the word is not found in pre-war lexicons, but had its genesis as to use and meaning in the conditions following our entrance into the World War. During the war, it was unquestionably a term of the severest reproach, well understood by all men, and calculated to subject its bearer to hatred and contempt in practically every community in the land. To falsely publish such an accusation of any person was manifestly libelous per se. Whether or not this would be so in time of peace, we need not determine. The court ended up reversing the case on other grounds. 
namely that the real culprit had been a rogue employee not under the control of the company. However, the holding amply reflects the universally understood poisonous import of slacker during that period. In 1918, World War I ended. Shoeless Joe Jackson had served in the war. At the time, star baseball players made $6,000 a year with no free trade market. Gamblers found it easy to hire game fixers. It is widely rumored that Joe Kennedy was the one who put up the money to bribe the players. Joe Kennedy joined his father-in-law's campaign team for Honey Fitz's attempt to win the Massachusetts congressional seat, then occupied by fellow Democrat Peter F. Haig. This set the political back alley dealing groundwork for Kennedy, which he later pulled all the strings needed to make his son the President of the United States. Kennedy realized that the ethnic mixture in Boston was making a very subtle change. First occupied by the Anglo-Saxon swells and now joined by the Boston Irish rabble, Boston had received a recent influx of the darkies, which immigrants from Italy were then called, sometimes even to their faces. Kennedy knew when an Italian vote for his father-in-law, it was as good as a vote for the upper class. So he formulated a strategy whereby Honey Fitz would get almost the entire Italian vote. Kennedy found out who the Italian mob bosses were in all the districts, and he paid them well to bring out the vote for Honey Fitz, even if it meant stuffing a ballot box or two, or cracking a head or three. And that's exactly what the Italian bosses did. As a result, Joe Kennedy's father-in-law defeated Tag by a mere 238 votes. Unfortunately, Honey Fitz's reign did not last too long when a year later, a congressional investigation turned up the voter fraud, perpetuated behind the scenes by Joe Kennedy. The election was overturned and Honey Fitz was booted out of office, never again to hold a meaningful political position. However, Joe Kennedy himself remained unscathed. Luckily for Kennedy, Italians know how to keep their mouths shut, especially if you grease their palms sufficiently. However, Joe Kennedy learned his lesson well, realizing the real trick was not only to tilt the election in your favor, but not to get caught doing so. Kennedy would never make the same mistake again. Kennedy decided on making an upwardly mobile move. He hooked up with Galen Stone, an associate at the Massachusetts Electric Company Board and a partner in the brokerage firm of Hayden Stone & Company. Under Stone's tutelage, Kennedy learned the intricacies of the stock market. Being good with numbers, Kennedy not only managed his client's money, but his own money as well. Joe was given a job with the venerable Boston stock brokerage firm Hayden Stone & Company after Mara Fitzgerald promised to swing business to the firm if they hired his son-in-law. Galen Stone, a friend of Joe's father-in-law, taught his protege how to make huge sums of money off unsuspecting investors by trading on inside information. While the practice of using inside information was not then illegal, it was unethical. Stone breached his fiduciary duty to his stockholders, while Joe made money because of his privileged position at Hayden Stone. Joe told one Harvard friend, It's so easy to make money in the market, we'd better get in before they pass a law against it. It was easy, as long as one was willing to breach trust. Besides using inside information improperly, Joe made fabulous sums through what were known as stock pools. This was a way of manipulating the market by forming a syndicate and arranging for the members to trade stock back and forth. By bidding the price of the stock higher, the pool members created the appearance that the public was bidding up the price. In fact, the syndicate members retained the profits. And when the trading public bit by joining the action, the syndicate members sold out, leaving the public with losses. Joe called the practice advertising the stock. In 1919, tabloid newspapers arrived in the U.S. On January 29th, the 18th Amendment was ratified. It prohibited the manufacture, sale, transportation, or importation of intoxicating liquors for beverage purposes. For Joe Kennedy, the law represented an opportunity to make huge profits. He formed alliances with crime bosses in major markets, among them Boston, New York, Chicago, and New Orleans. These would come in handy years later when his son was running for national office. Among his mob associates was Frank Costello, former boss of the Luciano crime family, who bragged, I helped Joe Kennedy get rich. Sam Giacano, 
who would later figure prominently in Jack's presidency, called Joe, one of the biggest crooks who ever lived. Joe bought liquor from overseas distillers and supplied it to organized crime syndicates that picked up the liquor on the shore. Frank Costello would later confirm that Joe had approached him for help in smuggling liquor. Joe would have the liquor dumped at a so-called rum row, a transshipment point where police were paid to look the other way, and Costello and other mobsters would then take over. They distributed the liquor, fixed the prices, established quotas, and paid off law enforcement and politicians. They enforced their own law with machine guns, usually calling on experts who did bloody hits on contract. Columnist John Miller wrote, The way Costello talked about Joe, you had the sense that they were very close during Prohibition. In 1919, anarchists sent 300 letter bombs to people including Rockefeller, and the Volstead Act, which prohibited the production, sale, and transport of intoxicating liquors, made a lot of crooks rich. Joe Kennedy first came to grips with the movie star Gloria Swanson in a luxury train arriving at Palm Beach. He embraced her with such passion that he injured his head on an overhead rack, knocked off his glasses, fell down trying to pick them up, then arose, his face smeared with lipstick and his white cricket trousers covered in dirt. Their first full sex encounter at her hotel left her bemused and vulnerable, whatever that may mean. In 1919, the Volstead Act, which prohibited the production, sale, and transport of intoxicating liquors, made a lot of crooks rich. One of them was Joseph P. Kennedy. In 1922, flush with cash in his pocket as a result of his manipulations on Wall Street, Kennedy decided to branch out into the business of rum running, which was the illegal transport of alcohol from outside the United States. People have said that Kennedy was a bootlegger, but by definition, that was not accurate. Bootleggers produced the alcohol, sometimes in bathtubs, hence the term bathtub gin. Rum runners, like Kennedy, found the best places outside America to buy the product. Then they purchased ships, speedboats, trucks, and warehouses in order to move the stuff into America, then distribute the booze to whomever needed it. In his first foray into the rum running business, Kennedy discovered a great source of top flight scotch on St. Pierre in Muldoon a group of eight islands approximately 16 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. There, Kennedy was able to purchase scotch for $45 a case. Using his head for numbers, Kennedy calculated that shipping and labor costs added about another $20 per case, making it a total of $65. Since Kennedy sold the scotch for $85 a case, that was not much of a profit margin for so dangerous an operation. So Kennedy copied what other rum runners had done. He cut the 90 proof scotch with water and other additives. Then Kennedy rebottled the scotch, which transformed an $85 case of 90 proof scotch into two cases of 45 proof scotch, which Kennedy then sold at $85 per case. Using this chicanery, Kennedy turned the usual 5,000 case shipment, which cost him $325,000, into a tidy profit of $200,000 per shipment a king's ransom in the Roaring Twenties. Being involved in the illegal rum running business also meant that Kennedy had to play ball with some tough customers who were doing the same thing that Joseph P. Kennedy was doing. This is where Joe Kennedy, even though he was born and raised in Boston, became a New York City gangster by association. One of the men Kennedy had to deal with almost on a daily basis was Oni the Killer Madden, who was partners with Big Bill Dwyer, called the King of the Rum Runners. By partnering up with Madden and Dwyer, Kennedy now had a New York City distributor for his scotch. Through several nightclubs Madden and Dwyer owned, including the Stark Club and the El Fay Club in Midtown Manhattan, and the famous Cotton Club in Harlem. In 1923, Joe Kennedy took Gloria Swanson to Hyannis Port, already a Kennedy fortress, where Joe's wife Rose had a museum of dolls in glass cases. He introduced her to his children as Rose's friend. Joe was not able to have sex with Gloria Swanson in the house, so he took her instead out to a boat called after his wife, the Rose Elizabeth. Six-year-old John Kennedy, the future president, was refused permission to accompany them, but stowed away below decks, emerging to find the couple stark naked and in the act. Shocked, six-year-old JFK dived overboard 
and had to be rescued from drowning by his father, to the accompaniment of hysterical noises from Swanson, who screamed like Fay Ray in the grip of King Kong. When Stone retired from the firm in 1923, Joe Kennedy, figuring he learned all he could in stock investing and the banking industry, decided to quit Hayden Stone and Company and branch out on his own. He called his new company Joseph P. Kennedy Banker. In just three short years, using the precepts he had learned at Hayden Stone and Company, Kennedy's net worth had ballooned to over $2 million. In 1924, Fortune estimated Joe Kennedy's worth at $2 million. Yet, since Joe had left Hayden Stone in 1922, he had had no visible job. While he made hundreds of thousands of dollars manipulating the market, only bootlegging on a sizable scale would account for such sudden and fabulous wealth. Joe used the profits from his bootlegging operations to fuel his continued stock market speculating and finance his efforts in the film industry. After making his fortune on and off Wall Street, Joe was one of the first Eastern businessmen to grasp the potential of the movie business. By the mid-1920s, the American film industry was turning out 800 films a year and employed as many people as the auto industry. Joe told several friends that this was a gold mine. After buying a chain of 31 small movie houses, Joe realized that the way to make real money was on the production side. Moreover, he was attracted to the glamour of Hollywood. Not only could he influence the way films were made, he could meet dazzling young women. In 1924, Kennedy moved his brood of seven children from Boston to the New York City suburb of Riverdale, where Kennedy kept a close eye on his two main money makers, Wall Street and the New York City distribution network of his illegal rum running operation. During this period of time, Kennedy also hooked up with known mafia hoodlum, Johnny Rosselli, who introduced Kennedy to Kennedy's new rum running partner in the Midwest, one Alphonse Scarface Capone. In 1926, Joe Kennedy convinced a patron of his brokerage firm named Guy Courier to finance his plans to enter the movie business. Using information he received at a, as a broker at Hayden Stone, Joe bought the Film Booking Offices of America, FBO, sight unseen from its British owners, and then received a commission of $75,000 from the trading company for the deal. Joe quickly changed the studio's focus to making cheap westerns and dog pictures that could be turned out in a week for $30,000 to $50,000 each. Although they lacked artistic merit, the picture sold and FBO profits ballooned. In 1927, Joe Kennedy used the profits from FBO to purchase the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, who had a new system for making motion pictures with sound. Now that Joe headed a studio, he wanted to buy a theater chain to distribute his pictures. This desire would eventually lead him to the infamous Pantages scandal. Kennedy purchased KAO, Keith Alby Orpheum Theaters Corp, a chain with 700 movie theaters in the US and Canada, and more than 2 million patrons daily. Edward Alby, the founder of KAO, had initially refused to sell out, but when Joe promised that he would remain in control of the chain, Alby agreed to Kennedy's offer. But once the papers were signed and Joe was chairman, Joe said bluntly, Didn't you know, Ed? You're washed up. Through. By 1927, Kennedy was so flush with cash, he decided to make his move out west and get involved with the movie-making business in Hollywood, California. His entry into Hollywood was greased by Rosselli, who, through fear and intimidation, had basically the entire Hollywood cast of characters under his control. Soon, Kennedy became the boss of the film booking company, FBO. Kennedy also created the Cinema Credits Corporation, which he used as a conduit to pull money from his financial cronies up north to invest in the grand schemes abounding in Hollywood. But Kennedy, wily stock manipulator that he was from his experience up north, made his first big Hollywood killing when he was hired as an advisor to Pathé, a highly profitable newsreel company that had been around since Thomas Edison invented his Vitascope projector. Having access to the full scope of Pathé's finances, Kennedy bought in at $30 a share. When Pathé was sold, Kennedy arranged to have himself paid $80 a share, while the average Pathé investor 
only took in a buck fifty a share. This type of stock manipulation is punishable by imprisonment today, but back then it was just a way of doing business that Kennedy had mastered up north. Lawsuits flew around, but Kennedy had stacked the deck in his favor, and nothing ever came of the lawsuits. In researching her book, The Fitzgeralds and the Kennedys, an American Saga, author Doris Kearns Goodwin uncovered old lost letters written by one of the Pathé investors, Anne Lawler, who ironically came from Kennedy's hometown of Boston. Apparently, through Kennedy's manipulation of Pathé stock, Lawler had lost her entire life savings. Lawler wrote to Kennedy, This seems hardly Christian-like, fair, or just for a man of your character. I wish you would think of the poor working women who had so much faith in you as to give their money to your Pathé. Old Joe Kennedy must have had a good laugh over that one. While in Hollywood and still married to Rose, Kennedy engaged in the same extramarital affairs that his son, Jack the President, would engage in a generation later. Joe Kennedy's affair with actress Gloria Swanson was an open secret, known by everyone in Hollywood, including members of the press, whom Kennedy paid to keep the news out of the tabloids. Old Joe even bedded down showgirl Evelyn Crowell the widow of dearly departed Larry Fay, who was Madden's partner in the popular El Fay nightclub, which featured showgirl Tex Guinan as the main attraction. Fay was also partner of the Casablanca nightclub, a midtown hotspot. On January 1st, 1933, Fay was shot to death shortly after the bells rang bringing in the new year by the Casablanca doorman, whom Fay had just informed that his pay was being cut. With the unfortunate Faye's marital bed still warm, Joe Kennedy jumped into it with his widow. The late Larry Faye and Rose Kennedy be damned. Kennedy knew his power in Hollywood would be limited unless he owned his own movie distributing company to distribute the movies, mostly mediocre, that he was making. In 1927, vaudeville headliner Al Josen's influential film The Jazz Singer opened. Profits at the Keith Albee Circuit's flagship Palace Theater in New York fell to two to three thousand dollars per week, compared to an average of ten thousand dollars per week earlier in the decade. With the looming advent of talking pictures, David Sarnoff, the principal of the Radio Corporation of America (RCA), which held a number of patents in film sound technology, established the film production company Radio Pictures in which Joseph P. Kennedy held an option and a managing interest, moved to acquire control of the KAO theaters through quiet purchases of the company's stock. And Kennedy and Sarnoff were successful in gaining control of KAO. Kennedy changed the name of the company to Radio Keith Orpheum, RKO. In 1928, Joe Kennedy was asked to serve as a special advisor on the board of Pathé Exchange, Inc a production company who produced a weekly newsreel. Joe soon became chairman of Pathé and began implementing his own ideas, beginning by slashing the salaries of the employees. The cost cutting applied to others, however, and not to himself. He was drawing a salary of $100,000 from Pathé. Later that year, Joe merged FBO with his chain of theaters, KAO, to form the famous RKO. Joe then had RCA, trade its FBO stock for stock of the new company, a deal which brought him $2 million. While his wife Rose was in Boston, pregnant with their eighth child, Joe was in Hollywood, engaged in his notorious liaison with the superstar Gloria Swanson. Swanson was by no means Joe's first extramarital adventure, but she was his first real affair. She was the perfect trophy to symbolize the great worldly success he had achieved. In February 1929, Joe Kennedy and Sarnoff approached Alexander Pantages with an offer to purchase his entire Pantages theater chain, the second biggest in California. Pantages initially rejected the offer, but that was not going to stop Joe Kennedy. Think about the horsehead in The Godfather. Joe's innate arrogance was now rampant, and when Pantages rebuffed his offers, Kennedy threatened him by boasting of his influence in the banking and movie businesses. Soon, 
Pantages found his theaters were being denied first-run blockbuster features from major studios. But that was only the beginning. The rapid growth of the film industry during the 1920s put pressure on Pantages vaudeville empire and eventually led to its demise in 1929. In mid-April, he reached a tentative agreement with Joseph Kennedy to sell his entire chain of theaters and theatrical real estate to the Radio Keith Orpheum Corporation, RKO, for $14 million. Difficulties rose, however. In May of 1929, Joe Kennedy had become so entranced by Gloria Swanson in Hollywood that when his father, P.J. Kennedy, died, Joe would not leave California to attend the funeral. Joe's cousin, Joseph Cain, later confronted him saying, you son of a bitch, you didn't even go to your father's funeral. You were too busy on the West Coast chasing Gloria Swanson around. Joe replied, I couldn't leave. If I left for two days, the Jews would rob me blind. A friend, Cain Simonian observed, Joe Kennedy didn't attend his father's funeral. When someone doesn't go to his father's funeral, you can believe he would do anything. Indeed, nothing so much illuminates Joe's character as his decision to remain in California while the rest of the family and many of Boston's most notable citizens paid their last respects to the man who had been responsible for so many of Joe's early successes. From Joe's entry into Harvard to his job as bank examiner and designation as president of Columbia Trust, PJ had always been there to help his son. Now that his father could do nothing more to help him, Joe was too busy in Hollywood to say goodbye. In 1929, eugenics framed two public accounts involving dysgenic dancers, one fictional, the other real. Erskine Caldwell published The Bastard, a popular novel that became one of the best examples of eugenic literature in the United States. Caldwell's Bastard is a man named Gene, who was born to a hoochie-coochie dancer and an unknown father. As a consequence of his ill breeding, Gene develops into a eugenic nightmare. He drinks excessively, commits incest, and spreads sexually transmitted diseases. Caldwell's fictional gene became popular at the same time that a very real Eunice Pringle became infamous. The public trial made a spectacle of the young dance in eugenic terms. Her questionable morals, her failure to complete high school, and her alleged prostitution. She was even forced by the judge to appear in court wearing the red dress in which Pantages allegedly raped her. When theater magnate Pantages broke ground on his 12-story Pantages Hollywood Theater at the corner of Hollywood and Argyle on March 20th, 1929, the Playhouse was going to be not only the second Pantages Theater in operation in Los Angeles, but it would also become the 67th in his long chain of vaudeville and movie houses. To design this massive theater, retail and office building, 210 feet on Hollywood, 310 along Argyle in Hollywood, Pantages turned to his go-to guys, Scotsman Benjamin Marcus Pritica, and for the interior, Dutchman Anthony Heinsbergen. This would be the 22nd theater they built for Pantages, including the 7th and Hill Joint. The Pantages, first to last, was designed for maximum audience comfort, with over 40% of the interior space devoted to public areas, lobbies, lounges, and restrooms. One of the first movie houses built after the advent of talking pictures, the Pantages Theater boasted the most elaborate sound equipment anywhere in the world. For the first time, sound could be channeled, either from a film soundtrack or from remote sources to the public areas of the building. The Bartlett Syndicate Building Corporation handled construction. The office portion of the building was a 12-story design. The foundations were built for that height, but plans were changed due to the deepening depression. What a difference 15 months make. On July 25th, Pantages reneged and only sold six theaters to RKO for just under $5 million. But Joe Kennedy wanted more. He wanted all of Pantages theaters. Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. was the father of JFK and the son of a saloon owner. He was without conscience or beliefs, by turns a bully and a coward, cruel and selfish, manipulative especially of his own children without taste or respect for anything except power, money, successful violence, and low cunning. Apart from his brilliant propensity to attract and keep money, sometimes by shrewdness, hard work, and fine timing, but often by dishonesty, betraying of friends, and association with criminals, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr. 
had no positive qualities at all. On August 7th, going against Kennedy, Pantages went on to transfer two theaters, including his flagship on 7th and Hill Road in Los Angeles, to Warner Brothers. Reported at the time as cash payments, his family later claimed that they were paid in stocks of the respective companies, which was soon to be depreciated. The rapid growth of the film industry during the 1920s put pressure on Pantages' vaudeville empire and eventually led to his demise in 1929. In mid-April of that year, he reached a tentative agreement with Joseph Kennedy to sell his entire chain of theaters and theatrical real estate to RKO for $24 million. Difficulties rose, however, and in the midst of the Wall Street crash of 1929, Pantages was in a tough spot of his own. On August 7th, his career took a turn for the worse. In Pantages' flagship theater, the Beau Arts in downtown Los Angeles, an hysterical girl in red emerged from the janitor's broom closet on the mezzanine screaming, there he is, the beast, don't let him get at me. She pointed to the silver-haired Pantages in the broom closet. The facts are still murky, but around three o'clock that afternoon, looking for work as a dancer and hoping to book her act on the Pantages circuit, a native 17-year-old Eunice Irene Pringle of Garden Grove, California, a well-trained, aspiring vaudeville dancer, hoped to book her act on the Pantages vaudeville circuit and appeared at Pantages Los Angeles office for her fourth time, but without an appointment with Pantages, insisting, despite several previous turndowns, to seek a private audience with Alexander the Great, as he was known in Hollywood, regarding her act which she wanted to book into his theaters. It was not the first time they had encountered each other. Pringle had been lobbying Pantages since May to book her one-act musical sketch. Previous attempts to book her act had not been successful but Prengel refused to let rejection stop her efforts to change his mind. Why he made the mistake of being alone with her in a small room, variously described as a broom closet or side office, may never be known. He knew how desperate actors could be for a shot at fame, yet he still accorded her a private audience when common sense dictated a more cautious approach. Reluctantly, he agreed and showed her into a small side room on the mezzanine level of his downtown theater. The meeting didn't go well, and it ended a half an hour after going inside the room. Matinee moviegoers saw a disheveled Eunice Pringle in a ripped dress and her hair askew, her clothing in disarray, running out into the street, screaming, and shrieking that she had been raped. Pringle screamed as she pointed at the silver-haired Pantages who followed behind. When the police arrived, Pringle told them that Pantages had attacked her after she came to see him to discuss her audition. Instead of offering her a job, he had pushed her into the broom closet, wrenched her underwear loose and raped her. Pantages' defense was that he was being framed, insisting that the young woman had thrown herself at him like a tigress, screaming at him, tearing at his shirt, suspenders and trousers, and ripping her own clothing. It had taken all his strength to push the athletic young dancer from his office. Whatever the source of his personal issues, on a balmy Wednesday afternoon, on August 7th, 1929, he let a 17-year-old dancer upend his life. Pantages denied it and said he was being framed. Pantages claimed it had taken all his strength to push the athletic young dancer from his office. Pantages' confusion turned into anger. He told the police, it's a lie, she raped herself. Pantages' rape trial turned Hollywood, ever seeking the sensational, into a cauldron of hate, hate for Alexander Pantages. The Herald Examiner wrote that Pringle was the sweetest 17 since Clara Bow. Two days later, Pantages was arrested and bound over for trial. Within days, a preliminary hearing produced an indictment, and on August 9th, Pantages was arrested and charged, accused of raping Pringle, and the press made Pantages the nation's most hated man. <laughs>